Hey there, this is Ari Witten, and welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. Uh, today, I have with me my buddy, Derek Dopker, who is a former, or I don't know, are you a former rock guitarist or a current rock guitarist, Derek? Uh, I I'm, I guess once a rock guitarist, always a rock guitarist. I'm not <laughs> playing in a band right now, but I guess I'll always be a, a rock guitar player. So you are a rock guitarist turned seven times best-selling author uh, and personal development expert. You are also an expert uh, on, I'm talking to you. <laughs> I'm talking to my audience. He's also an expert on, uh, on habit creation and how to permanently create uh, healthy habits in just a few minutes a day. He combines practical time-tested methods with the latest psychological discoveries on behavior change to help even the laziest procrastinators achieve their goals. So welcome, my friend. Such a pleasure to connect with you. I know we've been, we've been meaning to do this for a while. We should have done it a long time ago, but we're finally making it happen. Yeah, it's such an honor to be on here, Ari, because I'm a huge fan of the podcast. I'm sure anyone who's listening to this is probably knows how amazing it is. And uh, your Energy Blueprint program, useful not only for the people I recommend it to with health coaching, but for myself, I've... Um, there's so much just kind of cliche advice out there, like eat your vegetables and get enough sleep. And, and you were someone who really went deep on uh, so many of these topics around health that has opened my mind. So I'm glad to be able to, to contribute to this. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for the kind words. Uh, so let's talk about how you made this shift. You were obviously in fitness. You were a health coach uh, for a long time. You were a rock guitarist. Uh, and now your personal development guru, like being featured on, I, you, I know you got some big articles placed. I think it was what in, in Business Magazine and Forbes or something like that. Where 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 did you get published recently? Yeah, so I mean, uh, nowadays most of what I do is business coaching. Uh, what that entails, life coaching, health, all of that uh, as part of it. So Entrepreneur uh, Magazine, Success dot com, Forbes, uh, a number of places like that. Awesome! Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. So, well, so you started in health coaching and fitness and you've made this transition to personal development uh, and habit formation and, and that sort of thing. Uh, talk to me about this, this shift for you and, and kind of your, your story and how, why it is that you do what you do. Yeah. And I'd actually go back further uh, from the health standpoint, because now I'm a health enthusiast. I have been since I was you know, 17 years old, but when I was in high school, I was eating fast food every single night. Uh, and I remember my mom made like salmon and I'm like, I'm not going to eat that. Like I want a McDonald's cheeseburger and supersized Dr. Pepper. And so I actually hated anything to do with, with health. And what happened is I started, uh, one of the first shifts for me was I read a book and it showed me basically in, in the scientific details, this is what you're doing to your body. Like, here's how these trans fats are, messing up your cells uh, in what it's doing to your insulin. And I started going, oh, wait a second. Maybe that's why I'm tired, fatigued, have acne. Uh, like the last guy, you know, finishing in gym class, these, these runs. And I was, I was skinny. I wasn't overweight, but I, was, I realized that uh, back then, these habits of mine, which I didn't quite think of it as habits, and I now realize that like all these habits when it came to my health, were affecting my life right now. And I think where before I was thinking, oh, maybe when I'm, maybe when I'm in my fifties or sixties, I'll be health conscious, right? When I, when it's going to start to like catch up with me. When I saw at 17 years old, the impact that these habits have, that's what led me to ask this question, the question for anyone listening to ask, and that is, who do I want to be? And I started to think about like 10 years into the future, 20 years into the future as an adult, like just what is my identity? Do I really want to be someone who's eating fast food all the time, who's tired, who's lethargic, who's out of shape? And I just got, oh, no, that's, that's not the kind of person that I want to be. So it really started on this identity level of going, you know, I want to be someone I, like I, I care about myself. I want to take care of myself. And it led me to then do a, a total 180 and to now, okay, now I'm eating chicken breasts and broccoli that I'm bringing to lunch uh, in high school. I'm working out. I put on about 30 pounds of muscle in that first year or two, uh, or at least lean, you know, lean weight and you know, had a six pack and, and all this. So that got me started on my health journey. And I shared with a, a friend 
when I was learning, I helped him lose uh, almost 60 pounds uh, senior year of high school. Wow. But then what happened where it transitioned into in the coaching and the habits and the personal development was I found a lot of people would come to me for advice. They'd be like, Derek, I want to lose weight, let's say. That's a common thing. So, okay, great. Here's what you got to do. Uh, don't get hammered drunk every single weekend. That's not helping you. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> cut out these foods, start to do this sort of stuff. And I'd tell them what to do. And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that, that totally makes it. Wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do a thing. And I see even seriously committed people who want to change their life for the better. They want to improve their health habits. Like they knew what to do, but they just couldn't get themselves to do it. And if I'm being honest, there's plenty of areas in my life, even to this day, where I have challenges, like I kind of know what would be best for me and for my, my health and my energy and my body, but I don't always do it. So I became obsessed with human behavior, human psychology, and why it is that a person can know better, but not necessarily do better. And it's not enough to just understand it theoretically. I wanted practical information like, okay, how can I actually get myself to change? How can I help others, you know, clients, whether that's with health coaching or business or anything else. And so that took me down the path of personal development. I'm a uh, NLP trainer, although there's some stuff in NLP I question, there's some useful stuff there too, studying a lot about influence and, and persuasion and how you influence others, but influence yourself. And then all the psychology of behavior change. And, and that immersed me in that journey, which I'm sure I'll have some practical things to share with people. But that's basically the background of what got me into this was frustration with myself and others not doing the things that we know are actually in our, in our own best interest. Yeah. Uh fascinating, you know, kind of transition that, you know, the, the story, this journey that life has taken you on as far as what you've become interested in and what you've become an, an expert at. I'm, I'm curious, what is some of the science that you've learned around uh, facilitating new habit formation and, and facilitating behavioral change? What kind of fields of research have you dug into and and what were some of the key findings around those topics? Yeah, so if we're looking at habits, and first of all, why habits? Be, and that would be because if you look at health and health and energy, and so if someone is fatigued or they're having health issues, it's probably not, uh, I mean, in some cases, it could be just like an acute sudden thing happened to them. But a lot of times, it's things that have been happening over the past months to years have compounded you know, behaviors that could be the light exposure, their circadian rhythms getting thrown off, all these things, it's, it's usually a result of habits, right? What you're experiencing today. So that is the, the core area that I focus on. And so if you go something like Charles Duhigg, Power of Habit, he talks about the three phases of the habit cycle. Uh, there's the cue, the routine, and the reward. So if you break that down, then you can go, okay, how can we shift any one of these things in order to change habits. And so the, probably the simplest thing, the, the, I don't know if I'd say it's the easiest um, shift, but one of the most powerful shifts, if you want to change your habits is people think it's about willpower. Some people think it's just willpower. I got to have more discipline or willpower. And I think it was Yogananda has this quote, environment is stronger than willpower. So it's common sense if you think about it that it's like you start with the environment that will affect your uh, behavior so if you change the cue which is some sort of trigger in your environment maybe it's a time of day maybe it's someone sees uh they see cookies and they smell the cookies and they're like now i want cookies they didn't five minutes before but as soon as there's that cue that's what triggers the desire well virtually all your habits have some sort of cue associated with them. So breaking a bad habit is that you could remove that cue or bringing in a good habit is what can you put in your environment that makes that habit almost effortless or automatic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, someone wants to just a real simple example, someone wants to eat more uh, fruits or vegetables, put it in plain sight, put it, bring it to the front of the refrigerator even. Um, make that easy to access. Someone wants to cut out some of the junk food, remove it from the house, or some people just put it in a, a cupboard that they don't go into. Or I got a family. Okay, we'll create a separate uh, system if, if necessary. And I know it's not always practical, but like whatever you can do to separate your uh, 
shift the environment so it's not you're not seeing it you're not hearing about it you're not having these things that are coming in and triggering you as a cue to engage in um in the habit so that's one piece um second piece is the routine and that's the habit itself so you can have the same cue but you you substitute so instead of thinking i got to change my whole diet a lot of times i'm like what can you just swap out so what do you normally have and what's a better option? Uh, so that's diet or it can be exercise. Um, we, we could go into sleep. Uh, so you know, I'll leave it up to you if you wanna cover certain areas around health and how we can apply it to that. But the idea, probably the easiest one to explain is I don't teach people like start a whole new diet. I go, what are you currently having at that time of day? What's pretty close? And, and you can swap it out. So if they're having candy, okay, some raw cacao and, and nuts or something. Like that might be, it's easy, it's convenient, maybe a similar kind of texture that they can do that. And I'm like, let's start there because is it perfect? That's not the, the concern. It's what's just a real easy substitution so that it takes almost no effort or willpower to just instantly swap that out. Mm -hmm. And then finally, there's the reward and that is, uh, all for all things to become habits, there has to be some, you know, that dopamine release, that sense of like, oh yeah, good job. I'm, I'm happy about this. And uh, we could dive in deeper into that too. Uh, but for now, just covering the overview, that means feeling a sense of self-acknowledgement for even the littlest things that you do. So I'll give an example, like working, um, I hear, I hear examples of this, like I, uh, I went to the gym today and I exercised, but you know, I can only go for 30 minutes and then I didn't feel that good. And you know, so many people like my friends, they're in such better shape than I am. And so they're like beating them. Like, I'm like, no, that's a win. You got to acknowledge that you got to own that because as long as they're going, yeah, but I could have done better. Yeah. But this, uh, that will not reinforce it as a habit. So it's actually starting even just your own internal self-talk to go, oh, that's good. You know, I ate one piece of celery today. Okay, that's a step in the right direction. Nice job, right? And that, that ability to acknowledge yourself is so key because that's what's gonna reinforce it and make something an ongoing habit. Now, I wanna kind of dig into some nuances there for, for just a second. Um, you, you said, let's say somebody takes, uh, you know, has a stick of celery on that day and you say, you know, good job. That's a step in the right direction. What if it's in the context of they normally have five sticks of celery and they normally have, you know, three salads and, you know, they ate a bunch of McDonald's I, and, and this is probably an exaggeration of what might actually occur, but let's say they, they binged on McDonald's and, did, you know, did skip their two normal daily portions of salad and four of the five pieces of celery, but they did have one piece of celery. Should they be rewarding themselves? Should they be patting themselves on the back in that scenario? I mean, what, what, is, what is the appropriate sort of way of self rewarding oneself in, in, in a context like that? Yeah, so that's a great point, and that, that is, okay, well, was this actually a step in the right direction, or was it a step backwards? And that's going to depend what is their usual habit, right? So if they're usually, you know, eating a bunch of vegetables or whatever, but today they, they uh, regressed, they went backwards to only one stick and, and uh, eating a bunch of junk. The, what I found, and it's going to vary based off the individual, most people will take the, I'm going to beat myself up for all my failures approach. And that can, it can kind of work very short term, but it's not typically what actually creates the habit because you do need the, the reward. So sometimes actually looking for the one little good thing that you did can actually be helpful. And this is actually, uh, I'll, I'll jump away from health for, for a moment to just show you how this applies in different contexts, like a manager or a boss at a, a job the tendency is, oh, my employee, I'm going to talk about all the things that they did wrong. Oh, you didn't get this in on time. This isn't good, whatever. When you study human behavior and performance, a lot of people will actually do better if you can find the one little thing that they did right. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and and praise that and try to set them up for success because success breeds success. So I'm not saying there isn't a place for discipline or to say, hey, that wasn't that good. Yeah, you know, step it up. At the same time, though, there is something to go, okay, what went well? What worked? And finding even the smallest little thing and then acknowledging that. So yeah, you know what? It wasn't a perfect date, but I did have that one piece of celery. That's good. Mm -hmm. Then the next part, we want growth though. We want improvement. So a great question is, well, what could I do even better? So it's always focused on the future. Okay, I what can I do you mind if I interrupt you for just a minute before we get there? I, I want to add that you just triggered a memory of mine from actually many years ago, some research that I read um, around something called the, the healthy obsession model. And uh, in the context of weight loss, and specifically, there were some researchers looking at um, the, they were looking at the traits, the personality and behavioral traits uh, of or the psychological and behavioral traits of successful weight loss achievers versus non-successful weight loss achievers. And they were specifically likening the, the traits of uh, successful weight loss achievers to um, those of, a, uh, of, a, of an athlete, of a high level athlete, of a, of a committed athlete. And there were several aspects of this. It's, it's pretty fascinating research, actually. I, I used to have some presentations that that I would kind of lecture on the details of this research, um, but they identified some several specific traits that kind of made uh, successful weight loss achievers similar to high level athletes in their, for example, kind of their mental toughness, their ab ability to tolerate physical discomfort and kind of push through those, whether it's the physical discomfort of hard training and soreness or the physical discomfort of hunger pangs and cravings and, and so on. Um, but one of the traits that is a bit counterintuitive that they had identified, and you, you kind of alluded to this in passing, is um, counterintuitively, the successful weight loss achievers actually have a stronger negative emotional reaction to deviations from the optimal plan. Now, I, I think the context is, is really important here. And basically what this means is, you know, let's say they're doing really good with their habits, eating what they're supposed to be eating, sticking to the plan, exercising, sleeping well, taking care of the, you know, meditating, taking care of their, their stress levels and so on. Everything's really dialed in. And then one day, you know, all hell breaks loose. Everything goes down the crapper and, you know, they binge and they feel lazy and they just feel like sitting around watching Netflix all day. Well, the ones who are successful have a negative reaction, a stronger negative emotional reaction to that, where they go, uh, this is out of control. I need to get myself back on track. This is unacceptable. Tomorrow I'm starting, you know, I'm doing things right. Whereas a lot of the people who are, are less successful uh, basically just kind of go, screw it. You know, I've already, I've already failed. You know, I might as well just keep failing. I might as well just forget about that whole thing that I was trying to achieve. Um, so anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd add that obviously context matters such that, you know, if, if somebody is not doing the right habits, um, you know, frequently, and then they have a deviation to it, one's reaction to that would be different than if they are doing, uh, the right habits most of the time. But I, I just thought I would interject that here as, as being relevant to that discussion. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up. So I'll, I'll, I'll touch back on, on where I was going in a moment. But on that point, that's what I, I've noticed is like, there's a standard that you have for yourself. And I feel like athletes and people, there's like this sort of self-standard of, uh, I know what I'm capable of. I know who I am. This is way out of that. And it's that incongruence. It's like, oh, I can't let myself be like a lazy slob all the time or whatever, right? And And that negative feeling. So I also want to make a point of nuance. I'm not um, saying it's all got to be sunshine and rainbows and positive. Negative motivation tends to be stronger for human beings. Uh, avoidance of pain, avoidance of like, ooh, I don't want to go down that path uh, can be stronger. What sustains tends to be a sense of constant uh, feeling of positive, like, oh, I get, I feel good when I exercise. I like that I exercise. Like what gets me going to the gym is not avoiding getting out of shape. That's not what's kept me in the gym for 15 years. If I were to not go to the gym for a week or two though, 
or exercise at all, I start to get like, this isn't me. I feel like I want to like, you get like this itch, like I, I, this is not who I am, right? That identity. So what keeps the person going um, tends to be like a, uh, almost identity based or congruence with who they feel they are and not wanting to divert from that. I'll, I'll make a note. I'm glad you brought up athletes because this has been my observation. I don't have research off the top of my head. This is more anecdotal is that like I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So when I first get started and when someone's first learning something, it tends to be a lot more praise oriented uh, where it's like, you're doing a good job. Hey, that's good. Like you don't expect the, the white belt to do well. So it's not like, no, you're doing that wrong. You're doing that wrong, doing that. That would demotivate someone who's just starting out. They need those early wins. And I think Tim Ferriss talked about this and a guy I know who coached uh, basketball players talks about this. Like you gotta have the early wins. But once you get to a high level, a high caliber, like the top people, you don't need to like, hey, good job, nice. You showed up for class. It's like, <laughs> here's what you can do better. Like it's constantly a, at that high level, they want the challenge. So it's more, I, I almost see it like this shifting um, balance between like praise, here's what you're doing well, you're amazing, keep up the great work. And okay, here's what you need to work on. Here's what's not so well. If you don't, fix that, you know, you're going to get submitted. And, and, and so it's, it's a little bit more challenging and what's not working well. Mm -hmm. So the top level athletes, they can still benefit from praise, but it's like they're, if anything, their egos could be too high. You need to like kind of keep it in check. Whereas yeah, the, the motivation at that point is, is perfection and, and mastery. And so the goal is like intentionally seeking out any aspects of your game where you suck. Yep. so that you can you, you can fix them yeah and they built up the confidence at that point so once you have a certain level of achievement and, and habits you've built up the belief in yourself where you kind of tolerate a little bit more of the um someone challenging you let's say negative feedback or constructive criticism so a lot of what i'm doing i'm kind of looking through the lens of like what is a, an individual need right? At this moment in time, like what's kind of universal, but what's also personally tailored to uh, where a person's at. And that's that nuance. That's like, is this a deviation? Are they trying to just start a habit going? Are they regressing? Are they progressing? And so in order to maintain a balance, I would go back to, okay, what did I do? Well, it's always fine to acknowledge your successes. And then what can I do even better? Or, you know, what didn't work? So the person who goes, um, Oh, I screwed up today. I, I, I binge ate or whatever. Dwelling on what's already happened, there's just there's nothing that's going to come from that other than looking at where did I go wrong? Wait a second. How? What led to my binge eating? What was the cue for that? Let me let me decode that so that tomorrow I do something so it doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. So going forward, I'm going to do better. Right? What happens with the person who goes screw it? which is a very common thing. You know, someone goes, which, which, uh, it's hard for me to understand that. That's one of the frustrating things that led me to research. This was like, oh, I'm following this diet plan. And, you know, I had a couple drinks tonight and I didn't follow it and it's Friday. So, you know what? I'll just start over again on Monday. I'm like, no, you just start, <laughs> you, it's fine. Look, happened, great. So like immediately you just get back on track. That's, I think the, the difference in mentality. So I can give some practical tips of how to do that, but I'd say it really comes from um, this, this idea of the beating oneself up over the mistakes. It's okay to have some negative emotions around that. That can be useful, but then it's turning it into something practical. And again, it's that, how can I do better? What caused this? Let's identify what happened. And then now going forward, was I unprepared? How do I be prepared tomorrow? Was I around certain influences in my environment? If I'm serious about this, do I need to cut those people out or minimize my exposure? You know, what is it that happened? And then now let's fix that going forward. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a third piece of this that I think I interrupted you before you got into. I don't know. Did you, did you get to that or... Um, so basically, yeah, like what worked, mm -hmm. what could I do even better? Um, those are the two main things. So that's kind of the, the positive and the negative. And then, uh, the if, when, then planning, uh, is what the, the research shows is 
if people just have a good intention, oh, I'm going to start exercising this week. I think it's somewhere in the 30% uh, range of people who actually follow through. It goes up to almost 80% if people are like, this is when I'm going to exercise. After work at you know, 5.30, I'm going to drive to the gym. I'm going to do this, this plan. So they actually have an exact plan in mind for what they're going to do going forward. So if this happens or when this happens, then I will do blank. When the server hands me the menu and asks if I want dessert, then I'm going to order, I think the guy, uh, one guy did like, I'm going to order a green tea or I'm going to order whatever. So you're not caught off guard in those situations. You've actually thought about the obstacles or the challenges that are going to come up. And then you have a plan for it and mentally rehearsing it so that those things act as a cue to do the thing that you do want to do, the positive behavior uh, that's going to be healthier. Yeah. So, yeah. Got it. So uh, I, I want to present something that I think is, a, is probably the most complex, m- nuanced, and like most difficult um, example of the, the pattern of behavior that you're talking about. Um, I'll, I'll present it kind of sequentially. So one is like a simple example of what you're talking about is let's say somebody like walks into the office where you work and, you know, is like, Hey, I baked some fresh chocolate chip cookies at home today. And then puts, puts the tray right next to your desk and is like, Hey, would you like some right now? Now you've got this in your face environmental trigger or, or cue, um, that it's for most people very hard to resist something like that. Okay. Uh, maybe a, a more subtle version of this is like you're at home and you've got the cookies in your pantry, right? So it's not quite as in your face, but you know, it's still very clear that like just the, the presence in your environment, even if they're hidden in a cupboard, they're still kind of in your environment. Your brain knows it's there. I was reading this book uh, by Nir Eyal called uh, Indistractable. And he's basically talking about this problem of modern day distraction with, especially with technology and that we've become entrained into this habit of being highly, highly, highly distractible uh, to, to the extent where we're literally uh, compulsively checking. We're compulsively checking our phone, our text, our email, our Facebook, our social media, our Instagram, what, all these different things. We're checking them 300, 500 times a day. And this, this is the part why this is tricky. Um, because there isn't necessarily a readily identifiable cue that's present, like there is with the cookies being presented in your office or the cookies in your home. Um, where it's very clear what you need to do in the environment to fix that, this is much, it's a much more subtle thing where you're starting to, to be triggered to compulsively check your email or your Facebook. It's almost like the absence of a cue, the absence of any other cue is triggering the compulsive behavior, meaning like if you have a moment to yourself where you are not being distracted by something, your brain will compulsively seek out distraction on its own. So, I'm, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. And, and I'll also add, you know, a couple simple things that I got from this book that have been very helpful for me in wasting less time through distraction and minimizing some of the tech distraction is there's like a Facebook news feed eliminator, mm-hmm. which uh, is just a little plugin that you download for free, you know, in five seconds. And it literally shuts down your entire newsfeed on Facebook so that when you log on to Facebook, you no longer have this immediate population of, of all these different things that all your friends and, and, and colleagues and people you know are up to and, and are posting about. Um, so you're not inclined to spend 20 minutes scrolling through there. And uh, one of the other ones that I got is um, this uh, email, d- email sort of management technology. This one you have to pay a little bit of money for. It's called uh, SaneBox. And uh, it basically goes through and like sorts all of your emails uh, that are from, you know, third party sources or promotional business related stuff. And it basically just filters them out of your main inbox. So I went from like having 500 emails a day to having like 
40 or 50, um, which is a, a huge relief for me. Um, so these little pieces of technology can minimize a lot of the distraction that you'd, you'd otherwise have. I think it's a good example of it, but I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on kind of this problem of compulsively checking tech 300 or 500 times a day. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's the sign. I mean, the, the way habits form and the science behind it, it's going to be similar, whether it's a quote unquote good habit or a, a bad habit and something bad can become uh, or something good could become bad in excess. Uh, so with technology, Facebook, there's so much dopamine, there's so much stimulation and novelty. It's just, it's a, a it really is like an addiction. And I've certainly, I know I'm checking Facebook. I'm like, what's the thing I even need to see on here? What am I doing? Like, and I, I don't even remember how I got on. I'm like, I'm on Facebook. I'm like, wait, what was I doing like five minutes ago? Yeah. So it's, it's definitely become a um, part of the programming. And as you mentioned with the, uh, there's no real discernible cue. It could be though, it could be boredom. Uh, as you said, it could just be like, I have, I don't have some kind of rapid stimulation going in my, uh, on in my head and uh or something you know coming into me oh it's a quiet moment it's like, oh, what am i supposed to do here just sit here and i'm sitting waiting in line oh, i don't know what to do oh, i gotta pull my phone oh i'm going to the bathroom sitting down oh, i gotta have my phone like so and it's funny because i was actually reading an um an email a guy ian stanley is a marketer but he's talking about you know many great ideas he comes uh when he's just sitting in the ba- sitting in the bathroom right but no doesn't have his phone with him you know, you don't have a phone, don't have a book, don't have anything. It's just like, it's just a moment of quiet or in the shower and you don't have that stimulation. Then all of a sudden that's when great ideas pop. And it's like, your brain is finally getting a break. And that goes to show how important it is to, to take those breaks. So it's people I think have become myself included to a degree, somewhat addicted to stimulation. So it's lack of stimulation that's becoming uh, somewhat of a cue, if I were to say that. Um, the optimistic side is I notice for myself, so this is just a personal experience. If I'm on vacation though, like I don't miss checking Facebook or if I'm out in kind of a a completely different environment or highly engaged in something, I'm not missing Facebook. I'm not missing checking my newsfeed. So it does seem to indicate that there is an environmental component to it. Um, you know, certain routines and things that we get, get caught in. So in terms of uh, handling that, you mentioned basically that is a form of environmental control, somewhat kind of accountability as you bring in now the technology, which could be uh, the challenge also becomes a fix because now there's other technology that eliminates the newsfeed. Um, James Clear, who also writes on habits, a uh, big fan of his work. In um, I remember reading something that he talked about when he was working on his book, Atomic Habits, was that in order for him to get things done, he had his assistant go in, change the passwords on his social media sites so he couldn't log in. <laughs> and then uh, on the weekend, I think it was, he got the password so he could do it, right? Yeah. So we need to just, we all should hire assistants to just periodically <laughs> change our social media login information, email login information, like every week or two so that we just, we just get locked out Yeah. Well, it goes to show, I think this ties into something deeper, which is this idea. I remember talking to my mom, uh, it was something health related, but it's like, I feel like if I'm an adult, like I should just be able to do this myself. Like I should just be able to practice self restraint. And I think what happens is there's almost kind of an ego component of like, oh, I shouldn't need a tool. I shouldn't need someone else to kind of hold my hand and be like, all right, I'm going to change your passwords. But we're human. So we are very much respond to our environment. Uh, we respond to accountability. We need to create these boundaries. So one of the healthiest, most adult things that you can do is actually taking these steps to go, look, I know what my limits are. I know that I'm going to be distracted uh, by social media if I don't put something in place to keep me focused. So the the kind of easiest way again it's not that it's easy but the the most effective way is i go how do i create this environment so that it's either very difficult if not impossible to do the thing that i want to avoid and it becomes far easier and more effortless to do the things more of the things that i do want to do and that takes some design like you got to environmentally design just like you're talking about installing software getting an assistant getting a friend 
I remember when I wanted to change my language, that's hard, hard to change your language from, oh, I have to do this, I have to do that. And I wanted to shift it to, I choose to, I'm choosing to do this, I'm choosing to do that. And so we just had a pact with each other. Like if I'm saying certain things, you call me out. If you're saying certain things, I'll call you out. And it takes time, but you start to catch yourself and you shift your behavior, you shift your language. And as human beings, we're, we're tribal beings. So we're going to respond to other people in our tribe wanting to meet their standards. And I, I say, you just got to go with it. You got to learn how to use these things and leverage these things um, to your advantage. Mm -hmm. Do you have any specific practical tips as it relates to people trying to adhere to uh, healthier um you know, habits as if, as far as eating or, or lifestyle factors that, that can improve their health? Yeah. So the, if I were to just give people one technique, one tip, I mean, I, I talked about environment a lot, so I think that would go um, a long way, but if there's something else, it's what are called three magic words, uh, three magic words technique. And what they are is uh, they're, can I just, and then you do what's called a micro commitment. So BJ Fogg has talked about tiny habits and uh, this idea that a micro commitment is a really tiny, small action that you can do that you're guaranteed to say yes to. So when I talk about eating vegetables, if someone is not eating vegetables, so let's start at ground zero, right? That no vegetables a day, then it would be, can I just eat one piece of celery? Can I just eat one carrot a day? And let's go to exercise. This is where it's, it's really practical. Oh, I don't feel like going to the gym. Okay, can I just do uh, two minutes of exercise? Okay, if I can't do that, can I just do 10 jumping jacks? Can I just do one jumping jack? Can I just put on my, my exercise shoes? Right, you find the smallest thing and it's like, well, what's that gonna do? Like you're not gonna change your life with these, these tiny things. What happens is momentum generates motivation. If you get that first step out of the way, I've heard stories, someone goes, um, they just went to the gym. They're like, can I just go to the gym? I don't, I'm not even gonna do any exercise. I'm just gonna go to the gym and I'm gonna sit down and then I can leave. So they did that for a few days. And after a few days, they're like, I'm already here. I might as well start, you know, start doing something. And what happens is uh, by taking the smallest step, then you get into, in, into momentum. And for myself, even though I, in, somewhat enjoy exercise and I've been doing it consistently, I still find myself going, ah, I don't know, maybe I can kind of take it easy or whatever. And I'm like, hey, you know what? No, I'm just going to go and I'm going to do one exercise then I can quit if I want. Well, once I do one exercise, I'm going to, well, okay, can I do one more? Sure. Five minutes into it, the blood's flowing. I'm feeling good. Now I don't want to stop. Now, even though I'm telling myself, I can say, well, I don't want to leave. I'm already, I'm warmed up. I'm, I'm now I'm enjoying myself. But if I were to tell myself, no, Derek, you're going to go to the gym and you're going to do an hour of like the toughest workout of your life, I might mentally psych myself out. But if I give myself the micro commitment that gets my foot in the door and then just nudge it along little by little, this is working with your brain, you know, in a way that it appreciates because it's not overwhelming it. Um, and you got to find this balance. You got to do just enough that it's kind of a challenge, but you say yes to it. Now, if you're a hardcore athlete, then your can I just it might not be necessary. You might automatically just do it, or you might be, you know, need to do something a, a little bit more. But the idea is you find the smallest thing that gets you into action, and then you repeat it. So I'll, I'll give one more example. Can I just meditate for 30 seconds? Yes. Okay. 30 seconds into it, I'm always going to, I'm almost always going to keep going and then keep going and keep going. I could stop after two minutes, I could stop after five minutes, stop after 10 minutes. But the key thing is you get the consistency now because that's something you can keep up every single day without fail versus the, oh, I can't do 10 minutes today, so I'm going to stop. And then I go a few days without doing it. Then I do it another day. Then I quit. And while I haven't done it all this month, I'm gonna... that's where it leads to all that like up and down yo-yo sort of stuff. And that's why things don't stick because it lacks the consistency. So can I just gives you the consistency. Yeah. I, I'm curious if you're familiar with the book, The Motivation Myth. Um, I read that book maybe a year or two ago, and uh, it, was, it was profoundly insightful on the, around the concept of motivation because so many people, um, me included previously, kind of just felt like you needed to wait to be inspired 
to start something, to, to start working towards a goal or, or a vision. And um, the book really f shows that the, the actual science indicates that it's the opposite. Uh, it's exactly what you were just describing, which is uh, that by taking a little bit of small action, even when you don't necessarily feel like taking action, taking a little tiny action towards that thing actually creates a spark of motivation. And then taking another action builds it and builds it and builds it until it's a fire and it's a self-sustaining habit that you don't need to use willpower to kind of be motivating yourself or, or driving yourself to do something that you don't want to do. It just sustain, sustains itself. Um, I, I, I just, I think it's a really unique way of getting this point across, as you were just saying, to, to understand that motivation isn't something you wait to be inspired with. It's something that you have the power to create by taking these micro actions towards your goals. Yeah, that's exactly uh, that's exactly it. And it can go both ways, right? You can get motivated and then, you know, take some sort of action. The idea is then you're dependent on just fate, circumstance, just may, something will happen that'll motivate me. Whereas it's far more empowering when you realize that, oh, wait a second, you are in control to a degree of your own state, of your own emotional state, of your own uh, state of motivation. And so, for instance, uh, I mean, there's research on just physiology. If I, if I were to just like hold myself in a really bad posture and look like I'm sad and miserable, I'm going to kind of start to feel it. Whereas they do research, they, you know, put a pencil in someone's mouth and just force them to smile. All of a sudden they start feeling happier just by changing their physiology into that of a, of a smile. So you can take these small actions that shift your state. And then from the, uh, you know, the more ideal state, then you make a decision. So to make this practical, if I'm sitting around, if I've been sitting around watching binge watching Netflix for three hours, and then I go, okay, do I want to watch the next? And this doesn't usually happen these days that much, but it has been known to happen. So then I'm going, okay, now do I want to go uh, work out? Like if I ask myself that question in that state, I'm much more likely to get a no. But if I go, okay, can I just get up put on some music and dance because I like to dance, you know, for a couple minutes, just take a break to see how I feel. And so dance. Now I'm up, I'm moving. And then I ask myself, okay, now do I want to go work out or do I want to go back to sitting down and feeling lazy? And, and then I'm like, nah, I don't want to sit down. I'm, I'm feeling good now. Now I want to go work out. Mm -hmm. So you do the small things that shift your state. Then you make, you know, key decisions. And this can apply to so many areas of life where the decisions you make in a really poor state uh, tend to not be the best decisions, you know, whether around your health or anything else. So that's why state management and the understanding that you are in charge to a degree, I'm not going to say absolutely, but to a degree, you can manage how motivated you feel. So if you're not feeling motivated to do something, then you go, what's the small step that I can take that will generate that motivation that will start to you know, cultivate that fire of motivation and inspiration. Then when you're in that more motivated state, you take the next step and the next step until it turns into, as you're saying, that fire of inspiration. How do you interrupt? So, so when, when that's happening, like in a bad direction, how do you interrupt it? So let's say someone is stressed from work or relationship stress, financial stress, whatever. And then when they're stressed, they have a tendency to, to binge on potato chips and ice cream. What do you do to interrupt uh, a pattern or habit like that? Yeah. So, oh, I mean, the phrase, uh, I mean, NLP is called a pattern interrupt. And so the idea is, you know, really anything that does interrupt that. And I will say that breaking bad habits is not the area that I've studied quite as much as generating good habits. Although it is somewhat in, of an inverse, there's still certain things. So I, I, I'm not going to claim to be uh, an addiction. I don't want to give the impression I can help someone with a serious addiction. They would want to see a specialist. But if it's just like, oh, I have a desire to, um, I'm feeling kind of stressed. Mine is kind of going, I'm thinking about this ice cream, thinking about whatever else. It will be pretty much anything that gets your mind completely in a different um, state. So you could find what works for you. For me, if I can, again, put on music and dance, I've heard someone, I heard a speaker, um, Stacy O'Brien, uh, to give credit, and she was talking about uh, she her her former business partner 
like I think stole millions or something. Uh, it was some you know, horrifying situation. And so she was pretty like going in and kind of like downward spiral depression. So as those thoughts came up, negative thoughts, she would just start doing math problems in her head, like multiplication or some people like they count backwards or just anything complex math. Because what happens is just like, it just gets your brain out of that emotional sad state and almost a more analytical state. That's yeah. funny. It's funny that she chose math, like to focus on numbers after someone just stole millions from her. I, I, for me, I'm sure that would trigger me. I'm like, if somebody told, stole millions from me, I would be like, get these numbers away from me. I never want to think about numbers again. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and I don't remember the exact details. It was, um, or like suing her or it was something like that, which, um, which interesting. Yeah, I think he sued her because not that she did something wrong, but it would make her counter case look like it was retaliatory, if I recall. So I'm, uh, forgive me, Stacey, if you hear this and I'm getting details wrong, but I believe it was like that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. obviously very stressful. And the, um, yeah, so the numbers though, even though it might be a, a reminder, I think the principle behind it for anyone is what's just gonna be completely kind of out, uh, out of the ordinary. and this is it's going to be challenging like as she she said like she had to go back over and over again like she'd constantly be drifting back towards the the thoughts so i mean i'm thinking about the ice cream thinking about this thinking about that i'm sad i'm this so it takes uh it, it becomes a discipline and yes there's willpower involved yes this is what if it were the easiest thing in the world i guess it'd probably be a lot more like highly successful you know in shape, great, healthy, fit people, this is a discipline. The optimistic, the good side about it is, it's not like you gotta go into the gym and bench press 500 pounds on your first day. Most people don't do that. You start with where you're at and you just gradually, incrementally work your way up um, to, to higher levels. So the better you get trained at inner, you know, being in control of your own patterns, of your own state, that in and itself becomes, I guess, kind of a meta habit, if you will of the ability to go, wait a second, how am I feeling? Is this how I want to feel? Do I want to interrupt it? Um, and I would also say, interestingly enough, this gets into something a little deeper, that if a person is feeling, let's say they're, they're kind of depressed and they want to eat, the issue might actually be they need to feel the emotions more, which sounds counterintuitive. But the eating the ice cream is a numbing behavior in situations like that. For me, surfing Facebook, when I was feeling years ago, I was, went through depression and I don't know what I want to do with my life. Surfing Facebook was distraction, so I didn't have to think about that. So I say distraction is morphine for the mind. Mm -hmm. The ice cream, the different things. And what I had to really do is actually process the emotions. I had to actually go deeper into it and go, wait, what is this? What is it that's coming up for me? Because there is a message in there. And so actually working through the emotions rather than trying to run away from it was, was truly the long-term answer. So on one hand, there's pattern interrupts, which can be really useful in shifting your state. And then there's also the deeper work of going, why is it that I need to escape and, and eat these food? Why am I using food as a coping mechanism? What's going on there? And that's where I say either a, a coach or a therapist, or there might be other things uh, with some of this. That's not just a little trick that you need to use, but actually doing some deeper work. Yeah. Um, last thing I want to talk about is, is willpower. And uh, I know that there's been some controversy over this, especially in, I think, just the last couple of years. So I know Roy, um, I'm, I'm going to butcher his last name, but Roy Bauermeister or something to that effect, um, wrote a book on willpower many years ago, a very influential book that, that influenced a lot of people's thinking around will, willpower and promoted the idea of the sort of willpower depletion model, which is basically, or like, I think they even call it ego depletion, if I remember correctly. And it's, it's basically like over the course of the day, um, you, through having to make decisions, your willpower gets drained and then you're less and less likely to continue to make good decisions. Um, however, uh, I'm going to reference Nir Eyal's new book, Indistractable, again, because this is actually where I learned about the uh, controversy around this theory. I, I just assumed it was well established. 
he actually sa says in his book that uh, a lot of the latest research has failed to support and, and repeat some of those original experiments that were used to kind of build out this, this willpower depletion model. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts on the whole willpower depletion debate. Is this something that gets depleted or not? And what can we do from a, a practical perspective to, to use whichever frame you're, you're going to kind of arrive at? Yeah, so the idea like willpower gets depleted and it certainly seems to match some of my experience. I mean, at the end of the day versus the beginning, I seem to be more productive. I seem to be more capable at the beginning of the day. And at the end of the day, I notice um, kind of like, all right, I just want to kick back and relax. At the same time, I can also think back. And so by the way, you know, this is purely anecdotal in a one study, right? From my personal experience. Uh, other times where I'm like, well, if I'm, there have been days where like, if I'm really wanting to remember writing music, like I could stay up all night writing music and like, I never got depleted. Like I, I didn't have, I wasn't using my willpower. I don't know, but like I could keep going if I really told myself I could keep going. And, and that's also the other part. Like if I believe I have unlimited willpower, uh, even if I'm doing something tougher, if I'm like, I am tough, I can handle this. I got this. I can, you know, you can't stop me. I'm unstoppable. I got this. How much does that actually create this, um, belief and then is it really finite or is it that if you believe it's finite this is where some what I've heard some people say is it the belief that it's finite that makes it so and is it the belief that it's infinite that you might actually have near infinite or incredibly untapped reserves like when hearing about navy seals who you know they think they reach their limit but find out wait a second human beings are capable of far more than maybe um a person might think they are. So I'll just start by saying, I think it'd be arrogant for me to claim that I have the answer one way or the other. I'll leave it up to scientists to continue to, to study this. And at the same time, it's, there is a degree of self-fulfilling prophecy with a lot of this, this stuff. Just the fact that you believe something will, I, I believe, <laughs> influence your, your, your neurochemistry, right? Uh, it's a placebo effect. Is, is is example of that right you know um placebo effect doesn't work for everything but there's certain areas just the belief in something can influence your physiology so i go you know there's probably an element of truth to both of these things which is kind of the way i tend to think about a lot of stuff where when i hear any one extreme or the other i'm like there's usually some mix of of truth to, to all of this because i can see that practically speaking you, if you're low on energy, um, and if that's from fatigue, if that's uh, coming from health issue, depleted neurotransmitters, all those things, we are a physical being. And as a physical being, things get depleted. And if you're lacking nutrients and, and, and the proper production of things, I can't, I can't of course that's going to affect your ability to get things done. If yeah, I've been I, I mean, it, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I think if you are physically severely fatigued, like let's say there's some people who, you know, who are, um, uh, who follow the energy blueprint and, and my work and things like that, who, when they, when they first start, for example, the program, they'll say, you know, I can do, three hours of, of work in the morning. Um, and then I just absolutely crash and I need to sleep for three hours. Um, because that's how much, you know, how fatigued I am. So at that point where they've, where they've worked for three hours and their body's like shutting down, if you ask them if they want to, instead of napping or, or, you know, sitting down and relaxing, if they want to go to the gym and do a hard workout, probably, you know, not going to have a whole lot of willpower to, to be able to force themselves through, through that workout. So yeah, I, I think what you said is absolutely correct. I think the nuance of belief and the placebo effect is really important and kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think also there's some nuance around one's physical energy level and mood and how that kind of interplays with willpower in, in any particular moment. Yeah. And it also raises the question of do you want infinite willpower? Because if you take that person who is severely fatigued and their body is telling them you need to rest for your own good, you need to rest. The body right now needs rest and they 
certainly plenty of people can force themselves through things, which could be important at some times, but they continue to do it. And that uh, in some cases, what actually caused the fatigue is because they've been burning themselves out. They're yeah. the you know, super type A, high achiever. I can go, go, go and do anything. And then that becomes counterproductive. Yeah. And, and believe it or not, there's actually research to support the fact that you know, the, the driven type A, kind of classic type A personality types, workaholics, uh, self-critical perfectionists, um, those people actually do have higher risk, uh, uh, higher rates of burnout syndrome uh, and chronic fatigue syndrome. So there's very clear research showing exactly what you just said. Um, which you're just saying it logically, I'm sure you probably haven't even seen that research, but the, the science actually bears it out that if you do push yourself excessively and not listen to those signals from your body, you pay a price for it. Yeah. So it's, it's then becomes this balance of, okay, it's good to know that your belief, you can challenge yourself. Hey, I, you know, I can do more than I'm, uh, you know, maybe I thought I was, that's useful. This becomes an honesty with oneself and a, a question maybe even then how honest can we be with ourselves? So maybe also the usefulness of having an outsider, a coach, a mentor, some people who can, who can say, um, give us an assessment and, and help you realize if someone is, I, I just see both sides of it. Cause I've seen both sides. I've seen the people who they just want to, I don't really feel like working that hard. And so they're looking for a way out, but then I've also seen the people who, they're like, oh, I feel really bad that I'm not, I, I just don't have the energy to, to work out. And it's like, based off of all the past symptoms, like your body is telling you to rest. Like you don't need to beat yourself up over that. If anything, you need to like honor that. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is where, and this is where nuance comes in of, you know, who are you? What's the background? Where are you at on this journey? Because you could certainly take it too easy, but you could certainly push it too hard. And um, that's not something any, any, person can give you a one size fits all answer on that's going to take some uh, hopefully personalized attention and guidance through that process. So to, to wrap it all up, when it comes to willpower, I think there's an element of both. I think it makes sense to realize there's probably going to be times where you're uh, more resilient, probably, uh, you know, eating a better diet. I know eating better diet, getting enough sleep, that's going to affect my ability to, to get things done and your ability to get things done. So that's where seeing it as finite and valuing it and building it up as if it's this thing that you want to build up to good lifestyle habits is useful, but also recognizing that, you know what, you're probably capable if you believe, you know, it's cliche like self-help, just believe in yourself. If you believe in yourself and that you're capable of more, that actually really can have a, a real impact on what you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good stuff, Derek. Uh, I really, really enjoyed this, this interview. Um, I want to recap, but I feel like I'm, I'm spacing on at least one of the, the practical tips that, um, that you mentioned. So one, one thing is the micro commitments. I think that's really important. So the micro commitments, the concept of can I just, and how that ties in with the concept of motivation and, and creating the momentum of motivation, actually building motivation in yourself. Um, there is, you know, the, the elements that you were just speaking to around willpower, placebo, the self-fulfilling prophecy, um, and, you know, kind of those other nuances to, to willpower. Um, what, remind me again, what were some of the other layers of kind of practical things that we want to leave people with, that you want to leave people with here? Yeah, so the micro commitment's a great way to get yourself into action. Consider what your environment is. Right? Right. So environment, um, what is in your environment that might be derailing you that you can remove? What can you bring in uh, that's positive? Environment's also people. So things that you're listening to, you know, podcasts like this, hopefully a good source in your environment. Um, so positive influences. Uh, and I, I touched upon this, we didn't go in depth, but just the idea of accountability. Uh, it's kind of part of an environment like accountability partnership, uh, accountability groups. If you've studied personal development, it's probably not a new idea to have accountability. It's not the sexiest thing probably to think about, but it's at the end of the day, probably one of the most effective things. Or if I tell someone, hey, I'm going to pay you 50 bucks or I'm going to pay you 100 bucks if I don't do this workout or I'm going to clean your whole house if I don't follow through on this plan. Uh, there's places, website, I think, stick. Uh, you can donate to a charity that you hate <laughs> if you don't reach your goals or you don't follow through um, on things. So that, that's another uh, way where it's just about 
I, I say make your comfort zone really uncomfortable. Mm. That's the easiest way to get get out of it or stretch it. You know, I don't say completely break it, but stretch your comfort zone by making it uncomfortable. And uh, that's oftentimes done with accountability. So those are a few of the concepts. Beautiful. Derek, thank you so much for your time. Really, really enjoyed this. Um, it, where do you want to direct people to? I, obviously, you've got a bunch of uh, great books on Amazon, The Healthy Habits Revolution, a number of others. Uh, but is there any place in particular, your website, uh, that you want to direct people to or any free gift? Or like, do you want to tell people about your services and kind of who your ideal client is that, that you would like to work with? Uh Sure. Well, first of all, I want to gift everyone listening to this, I'll actually gift you a copy of the Healthy Habit Revolution, which will cover the things we're talking about and more. And I know, I mean, hearing on a podcast, and like I said, it seems like there's all these kind of ideas that are out there. And what I wanted was a very step by step process. Like, this is great, but how do I actually apply? Like, what do I apply today? So the Healthy Habit Revolution is just day one, you do this, day two, you do this. And I, I take you through a process piece by piece. Uh, so it incorporates the environment component, the micro commitments, the accountability, language shifts, all of that, uh, and then puts it together into a five minute a day action plan by the time uh, you get to the end of it. So the, you can get that at uh, the audiobook of it at excuseproof.com forward slash energy blueprint gift. So again, excuseproof.com slash energy blueprint gift. Uh, so that's a, a free um, free copy of the book. Then it comes with the workbook that you'll get for free. So that's my Thank gift. you, by the way. I, I appreciate you gifting that to my audience. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, so you'll, you'll get a recap of some of the things we talked about here plus more and now into a step-by-step -step process. And then... Um, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the main thing. You can find my books on Amazon. You can send me an email. Uh, if you get the gift, send me an email. Let me know what you liked. Uh, most of what I do these days is more like business um, business coaching and things, but uh, love talking about habits and, and happy to help any, anyone with any questions that you might have. Yeah, thank you. Well, if you, if you want, I mean, not that this is a business podcast and probably most people listening to this are, um, are just interested in improving their health, but there might be some people out there who might be interested in your business coaching services. Uh, um, I want to let everybody know I make nothing, no commission, no affiliate deals or anything like that. If you decide to sign up for coaching with Derek. Um, so, but, but Derek, please, you know, tell people a little bit about your services in that regard in case somebody is interested. Yeah. So, uh um... I'll say briefly, most of what I work with are authors, uh, especially I love working with people in the wellness space, though. Um, so people, authors or people who want to write a book and turn their expertise into a best-selling book. And then also things, with email, uh, marketing and, and all that sort of stuff. So essentially, uh, if I had to summarize it, it's fellow people with a passion for improving people's lives, especially when it comes to health and wellness and how do you get the message out there? Because everything I've learned about habits and psychology and persuasion for oneself and helping others. Same thing when it comes to creating habits for people who want to buy your product and keep using it, but hopefully a, a good product that enriches people's lives is the, uh, the whole idea with that. Yeah, beautiful. And if somebody wants to reach you, is the best place to do it to go to excuseproof.com and hit contact there? Or do you want, you want to say your email or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my email info at excuseproof.com. Wonderful. Derek, really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Long time in the making and uh, it was really a pleasure. Yeah, I appreciate it, Ari. Thank you. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview and I will see you again next week.